Welcome to Beauty at Work. We are in between seasons at the moment, so please enjoy this clip from one of our episodes. When I studied mathematics, I had a boyfriend who also studied mathematics, um, okay. but he uh, had a second um, major, I think you would you would call it, which was sociology. Um, so I became very interested in sociology, in particular in the question like, what can mathematics tell us about sociology? So I've always had this side interest in, um, you know, the dynamics of groups and what can go wrong in groups. Also, partly, I think, because I'm German and, you know, some things went wrong in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so so what happened was uh, after my PhD, um, as I said, I worked on the possibility that the Large Hadron Collider could produce those tiny black holes. And um, the first time I gave a talk at an international conference about this, so not an internal thing, um, someone asked me, why would those black holes be produced at the Large Hadron Collider? Why not at even higher energies? Like, why should they become accessible right now? And the answer I gave to this was what I read in all the papers. Uh, it's an idea called naturalness. Uh, it's because that's natural, and yes, you could push it to higher energies, but then it would be it would no longer be natural. And and this person, you know, I still see him sitting there, nodded and was like, "Yes, okay." And I felt incredibly dumb because I didn't understand the answer. <laughs> You know, it was just right. something that I'd read somewhere. And so um, in, after this conference, I tried to make up for this and tried to figure out, like, just exactly how does this argument with the naturalness goes, go. And now it's very interesting if you look in the, liter in, in the literature, like it goes back to an idea that came up in, in the early 90s or something around the time, people were very clear that this is an, an ambiguous concept. You know, it, it relies on some arbitrary assumptions about the probability distribution, but it doesn't really matter. The, the thing is that it's like it's a human construct, so to speak, and it fulfills certain you know, um, certain purposes that, uh, which is why people invented it at the time. But it, it was never meant to be a criterion to single out particular theories as good and other others as bad. This is something which um, which developed much later. Which indeed, interestingly enough, by um, Gian Giudice, um, who was, when I wrote the book, he was the head of the theory division at CERN, but I think he isn't anymore. In any case, so he's like a big, you know, um, big guy in, in the theoretical physics community. He, uh, he wrote uh, a paper, which you can read on the archive, where he says that this idea of naturalness uh, developed by a social trend or something in the, uh, in the community. Social trend is not exactly the phrase that he used, but it was something very similar. You know, I'm, I'm not good with pulling quotes out of my memory, too old for sure, this. Sure. But, um, and so, like, so in my head, this kind of, it, it rang this huge warning bell. It was like, this is like really weird. Like, this is, an, this is not an argument that you would expect to appear in science. And so mm. uh, when, I, when I looked into this uh, notion of naturalness um, further, uh, it turned out to basically be an, a beauty ideal. You know, it's like we mm -hmm. want our theories to be this way, but there is no further reason for it. Um, there are a lot of um, scientists, um, theoretical physicists, who have tried to come up with justifications for um, this idea. But they, fall, they all fall apart if you look at them any closer. There have actually been some uh, philosophers who've written about this. And so I ended up in this weird position that, um, well, I had based my PhD thesis on something which, in hindsight, uh, I don't think made any sense. So I uh, and do, do, you, do you mean naturalness? Was that was naturalness yeah. per se part of what you're well, saying there? Okay. It, it, so so th this is the interesting thing. It didn't actually come up in great detail in my thesis. It's just it enters in this assumption that it becomes accessible at the ener energies that the Large Hadron Collider could produce. So it underlies all those predictions for new physics at the Large Hadron Collider. They're all based on this idea of naturalness. Let's, maybe, maybe I should ask you to specify then before. Sorry, sorry. What to, just for our listeners who don't know what naturalness means, could you sort of uh, give a give a brief 
uh, definition of that? Well, naturalness is the idea that if you write down a theory and um, you have to introduce some numbers without units, um, then those numbers should be approximately one, not exactly one, but somewhere close to one. And then we can discuss exactly how large or small can they be, you know, is three too large, is seven too large. Uh, some people, you know, would maybe accept even 10 or 100, uh, but you wouldn't accept something like 10 to the 15. Uh, and the standard model happens to um, contain a number, actually, there's a second number, but let's stick with the, with one number that's uh, best known, uh, which is the mass of the Higgs boson divided by the Planck mass. That gives you a dimensionless number, which is about 10 to the minus 15. And uh, physicists say that's too small. It's not natural. Um, and so um, th they think it requires an explanation. And uh, this gives you justification to add all kinds of new physics, for example, supersymmetry, or for example, extra dimensions with, which lead to those tiny black holes. And there are lots of other things that, that you can add. They're all based on this idea that you somehow need to get rid of this small number. Now, there's, there's nothing uh, you know, technically wrong with this number. It's just a number. <laughs> You know, you put it into the theory and it works. And that's, in fact, how people use the standard model. They just put in this number, done. So it's not like, like there's mathematically there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that they don't like it. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't quite like this justification. And so what happened was after my PhD thesis, I couldn't find a justification for what I had done myself. Uh, and no one seemed to understand what my problem was in the first place. People basically told me, I just don't understand, you know, undergrad physics. Uh, look at those lecture notes, uh, th this kind of stuff. And so I was like, OK, I don't understand what those people say, but I want nothing to do with it either. So I decided I'd stop working on it. And, and, and that's what I did. Actually turned down a pretty big grant and <laughs> all my friends um, said I'm, I'm crazy for turning it down. Um, but yeah, so I went to Perimeter and I, I worked at um, Perimeter Institute in, in Waterloo, in Canada. And, and I worked on um, how to experimentally test quantum gravity for several years because I thought that was, uh, it doesn't rely on this idea of naturalness. Um, but this was all before the LHC turned on. And at this point, I was pretty convinced that all those arguments for new physics um, at the Large Hadron Collider were wrong because they were all based on this idea of naturalness. And so I started writing about it, first on my blog, um, started writing about this before the LHC turned on, I want to emphasize. <laughs> right, uh, and right, right, right. well, you know how it went, you know, um, th those new particles were never found. Um, so, and uh, after a few years of this, um, physicists began moving their predictions to higher energies, because that's uh, the way the story <laughs> has been going for several decades. Uh, and uh, I just, you know, it was just obvious that at some point they'd say, we need a bigger collider. <laughs> right. And right. Uh, this is when I thought I have to write a book so people understand that this argument isn't scientific. Um, so I, and okay, we can, we can de discuss how well the public, the broad public would actually understand uh, what, what's fairly philosophical or technical argument in my book. But still, I felt like I have to do it because who else would do it? Like I was basically the only one. Uh, and this is why I wrote my book. I, I just felt I had the responsibility to explain to people why, if they put all this money in the next bigger collider, it almost certainly wouldn't find something. And this almost <laughs> is very important because, of course, I can't rule it out. You know, it could always be, um, you know, they find something after all. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it's a sort of canary in a coal mine situation, right? It seems like you were, you were sort of raising the warning bells and, and pointing to the red flags as, as the LHC is, is, is taking off. And, uh, and so, so, so there's naturalness at, at, as one of the criteria that, that's being used in making these predictions. There's also, you say, simplicity and elegance. Are they also driving these predictions? Could you say a bit about those? Yeah, maybe one, sh one thing I should add is that um, the people who work on this stuff, they don't think of it as uh, beauty. You know, it's just for the most part, they just um, use it as uh, a mathematical requirement. Um, and you, you have to prod them a little bit, you know, to figure out just why do you use it, <laughs> basically. 
Because uh, it's not it's not necessary for mathematical consistency to assume these things. Exactly, right? that's exactly the point. It's not necessary. And yeah, so besides this naturalness, um, they use simplicity, usually in form of unification. Um, this is very prominently um, present in the idea of uh, unification of the forces in the standard model, uh, where physicists have developed new ideas starting in the 1980s. Uh, they have been falsified to the extent that they could be falsified. Um, there are still some, you know, out there, uh, which people are trying to falsify. And whenever one gets falsified, you can come up with a new one. So it's basically, it's not going anywhere. And then this idea of elegance is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly vague idea. Um, but that people have uh, quoted to me uh, many times. It's basically this idea that a theory um, has to give rise to surprising connections. You know, you have to get something out of simple assumptions. Um, yeah, for, for example, string theory is a theory which is often described as very elegant because it starts from this very simple um, idea. Everything is made of strings, uh, tiny interacting strings, and they wiggle around and so on. But then you get out um, surprising, surprisingly many things, like, for example, um, the graviton, right? And you can also get fermions and bosons um, and uh, gauge groups and stuff like this. So it's uh, it, it's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, but just because one set of theoretical assumptions can generate uh, these outcomes, that doesn't mean there aren't other ones out there that may not look so beautiful, right? I mean, is that part of your your argument there, that, that this doesn't have to be the only criteria by which we make predictions about theories or, or, or that, that drive, should drive theory choice? Um... Yes, it's a little bit more complicated. A lot of people think that I'm a string theory critic, um, which is actually oh, not right. the case. You know, as I, as I said, I've I've always been very sympathetic to the idea of um, uh, string theory because it it solves the real problem, which is the problem of how to unify the standard model with um, uh, with gravity. So for which you need the theory of quantum gravity. Um, yeah. I, at least this is the idea. You know, technically, it's never been shown that it actually solves the problem. <laughs> so th th this is where the problem starts. I, th I think string theorists have basically given up even trying. It's They generally believe that it does, but I think formally it's never been proved. Um, so, so that's already weird. But at least in principle, I think string theory um, has a good motivation in the sense of solving an actual problem. So I don't have a huge problem with with uh, string theory, but where uh, problems start is, is stuff like supersymmetry, which, um, I mean, string theory kind of needs supersymmetry, but let's leave this aside for a moment. Um, supersymmetry is believed to be necessary to solve this naturalness problem, but I'd say it's not necessary to solve the problem to begin with. So, so what do you need supersymmetry for? <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, su supersymmetry is not just one model, you know, it's a huge number of mo uh, different types of models. It, it's really complicated, which is why there have been so many papers written about it, because um, there's so much stuff that you can explore in this great mathematical space. But as you correctly say, just because you can write it down and it looks pretty doesn't mean it actually describes reality. And there are lots of theories that you can write down that look good on paper, but they just don't describe the universe that we live in. Yeah, yeah. So so is this massive sort of generation of papers around beautiful mathematics some kind of mathematical masturbation? Or like, what do you, what do you see as driving this kind of uh, pursuit, right? I mean, I think you, one of the things you point out is is just the abundance of uh, papers that are being written, and even even um, the, the abundance of journals. And I, I, I read some recent statistic that 70% of the publications these days in, in scientific uh, journals are not read by anybody. Uh, and I wonder how, how this sort of the, the, the social context of science is, is driving some of, some of what you're seeing here. I think it's a generational thing. So um, I think that the people who originally started working on this, as I said, you know, after the standard model was completed, they had, you know, pretty good motivations. And it made sense, you know, that the next thing that you'd look at would be a grand unification or string theory, so you could include the graviton. But then over the course of time, 
um, this didn't work out and uh, people just started making those models more and more complicated. And it's around this time that things started going wrong. You know, then there were um, experiments coming in and they falsified some of those theories, but they didn't get the message. You know, they just continued doing the same thing over and over again. And then at some point, I think people learned that you can get away with it. You know, you can do it. You can publish those papers, even though there's no evidence for it. Uh, and even if they are falsified, you just move on to the next thing and that pays the rent. So it becomes this this big bubble of nothing. And uh, I, I think that they're not really aware of that this is what's going on because you've if you've grown up in this community, of, and I mean, they're all serious scientists, you know, it's not like they're frauds or something. Um, they all believe it. And it's really hard to go and say, well, actually, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, why are you doing this? If you have like several thousand people telling you that, but of course, that's the thing to do. And this isn't something which is specific to um, particle physics. Uh, I find it interesting that a very similar thing has happened in uh, psychology. Uh, and parts of uh, sociology where they had this issue with the uh, you know, sloppy measures of statistical significance, which is something that mathematicians and uh, st statisticians um, ha have been writing and warning about for decades. So it wasn't, it wasn't that it was difficult to realize, <laughs> but they did it because everyone did it. It's what they, you know, that's what they were taught to do and they thought it was okay. So, um, and as I said, it becomes really difficult if you if you are in this community. This is how you make your income, um, and it, and it's okay because you can get it published. Then you continue doing it. So, how, how, so that's the interesting question: is then how do you how do you stop something like this? And the psychologists manage to do it, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, and they're still. I mean, they are still struggling with the the reproducibility replicability crisis and and with p hacking and so on. Um, we still don't have enough respect for null findings, and so we we're constantly chasing after whatever you can, you know, demonstrate as being statistically significant, which is easy to manipulate. So, um, but I mean, I, I mean, these are these are really powerful biases that you point out, right? I mean, groupthink and social desirability and the sunk cost fallacy and. Uh, and then this big blind spot that that scientists of all people, uh, you know, would would see themselves as being immune to these biases. So, so how did how what was the reaction to your book? I mean, how did scientists respond to it? Were were there people willing to say, "Gosh, I, you know, I, I realized that this bias was driving me," or did they did they sort of reject your argument, or what, what was what's it been like? There was basically no reaction from people in the community, at least not that I wow. I've heard. It's not that anyone came to me and said, oh, you know, the, your book really made me <laughs> think <laughs> it just didn't happen. Um, but, I mean, y y you know, I've been very vocal about it and I've, I've made fun of particle physicists uh, deliberately, I have to admit. Um, uh, and uh, it's interesting if you look at interviews uh, that particle physicists give um, on both sides, they don't talk about beauty anymore. This used to be really, really common, you know, in public um, in public outreach, uh, in um, popular science books, uh, in, in on all those pages. They would go on about how beautiful it is, and you know, unification, string theory, and 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 so on and so forth. They don't do this anymore. So I. I I think I reached some people. <laughs> at least, uh, yeah, at least yeah. they seem to have realized that this isn't something that scientists should openly admit. <laughs> uh, whether whether they actually stop doing it, that, that's another question entirely. Beauty at Work is brought to you by Templeton Religion Trust. If you enjoyed this clip, go check out the full episode, and please take a moment to subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps get the word out about the show. Thanks, and see you next time.